thank you so much, Helen. That's a really inspirational uh, beginning. I'll stay here for Doug's benefit. Um, and I think we're still at the stage where we have nice words and we haven't converted it into action. We've converted it into an action plan. So that's the first step. So um, I'm here really as the chair of the, uh, the core group um, who's, who's developed the action plan, um, really to describe, I think, the processes that we've gone through, which reflects a little bit of what Helen said, to create the plan. I, I don't want to go through in great detail what the plan contains and what's in it and so on and so forth. It's more about the process and the journey that we've, we've been on. And because this is a launch, I thought I'd include a photograph of a, of a rocket. Uh, it's not one of our rockets, I'm afraid. It's an enemy rocket. But nevertheless, it's a nice image of a rocket launching off into the, into the sunset. So here we are. That's, that's the launch element. But the rest of it, I'm just going to talk um, about the plan. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about background to the plan, overlap with some of what Helen has already said to you. Um, and then the process that we've we've gone through, um, you know, I, I'm the chair, but actually this process has really been led by Alice Thorne of the park and her her colleagues, um, and and actually particularly Sophie Jones, who's somewhere around in this uh, building today, who's now left the park, but has nevertheless kept us on on the straight and narrow during this process. Um, and some of the outcomes of that process and and where we hope to go in in the future. Um, so, as most of you know, um, there is a lot of historic environment in the park, as Catherine has already said, and as Helen has also already said. Uh, you know, the, the, the National Park landscape is shaped by human action over the past many thousands of years. And there's no, no National Park in the UK, no landscape in the UK that has not been shaped by human action. So. Um, all of this natural biodiversity that we're so concerned about sits within a framework, a landscape that's been created by human action. And there are some numbers on the screen there which give you an indication of some of the official heritage, if you like. So heritage, um, that list at the top left is sort of heritage that's kind of been noticed by people like me, I'm an archaeologist, and other heritage professionals who written down what's an important building and this is an important lump of stones which may or may not be something of interest you know and some of those are protected by being designated as scheduled monuments or listed buildings and some of them aren't um there are seventeen thousand entries in the historic environment record maintained by the world Shark of trust which reflect the importance of the heritage assets that sit within this this landscape and it's it's quite a large landscape, I suppose, by, by UK standards. Um, but it's, a, it's one with challenging um, management issues, or, or which, where the, which the management presents some challenges. Because it's not all in a single ownership. It's in many different ownerships. There are many different stakeholders. There are individuals who live in the park, of course, and work in the park. It's a working landscape. It's very much a working landscape. But as Helen said earlier, it's also highly dependent on um, tourism, uh, over 4 million visitors a year come here and do various things. Um, many of them interact with the, most of them will interact with, the, all of them in fact will interact with the historic environment, but not all of them will realise that, only a small number will realise that that's, that's what they're, they're doing. So it's trying to cover all of this, all of this ground, make sure that the historic environment is protected, but also make sure that the historic environment in its broadest sense is contributing to this new way of thinking about Ban of, of creating a new vision and a new way of, of living in the park. So, to develop our historic environment action plan, um, of course, we're doing that within the context of the management plans. Here's some previous management plans, um, all of which, I have to be said, uh, do mention heritage and in different ways. Um, in the earlier plans, it's a bit more fragmented. So there's a section on archaeology and there's a section on historic buildings and there may be a section on landscapes. Um, and increasingly, as, as time has marked on and these management plans have evolved, and indeed are thinking about the historic environment and the idea of the historic environment has evolved. So heritage has come together, the historic environment has come together, and that's certainly the case, case here. And we're in the context of developing this new management plan. Helen's already spoken eloquently about, about this position of change that we're, that we're in, brought by COVID, by coming to the end of a, of a natural uh, stage in the management plan process, new chief executive, a refreshed 
outlook for the, for the National Park, new way of thinking about how the world works, which is where the new plan comes in. And so it's really been a wonderful opportunity, I think, in the historic environment sector for a really step back, think about how we've managed this landscape and how we might continue to manage this landscape going, going forward on, on behalf, not just of ourselves, um, people who, who use and live in and love the park, but also for future generations, which I think is really, really important. So um, the, there are some internal drivers that have driven the process of the Historic Environment Action Plan, which stem from the management plan process, which Helen has described. Part of that is the vision and strategic objectives for the management plan, landscape and nature recovery, community and rural enterprise, inspiring people and places. And as Helen has already said, the new management plan is a plan of plans. Um, and the Historic Environment Action Plan is one of those, but the, it interlinks with um, plans which involve things like rights of way, place planning, local development plans, equality and community involvement. And all of these address these cross-cutting themes of health, well-being, social inclusion, decarbonisation, nature recovery, and so on. And that feeds again into the five interconnected missions that, that Helen spoke about. We also have a number of external drivers to the Historic Environment Action um, national park principles, the sustainable management of natural resources, the importance of placemaking, of community, and so on. Um, and here in Wales, of course, the very important and I think extremely valuable um, Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which, which is a groundbreaking piece of legislation um, passed by the Welsh Government, um, which requires, I'm sure we're all familiar with it, but it requires um, public bodies to, to undertake work with an eye to future generations and the well-being of future generations. And of course, as well as the seven well-being goals, which concern uh, a whole range of things, including culture and heritage, um, there are also the five ways of working. And that, and that is very important because that's about collaboration and, and participation and, and working in a, in a very positive and, and useful way. So we've been influenced by these external drivers in a general sense. Um, and of course, there are some specific external drivers that relate to heritage, and these range from sort of international uh, conventions, the Valletta uh, Convention, for example, which um, is all about conserving and protecting heritage, um, and the Faro Convention, which talks about communities and community relationships with heritage and the different communities and their interaction with heritage. So that's really international high-level stuff. And then, of course, within the UK and within Wales, we have a series of legislation of varying ages that relate to heritage. I've already touched on the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, but of course we've also got the Historic Environment Wales Act 2016, which is currently being updated into a single unitary piece of legislation for 2023, and a series of policy documents that, that relate to that, historic environment um, priorities and so on, conservation principles. Plus, of course, non-heritage, but um, related work like planning um, and other regulation, uh, TAN 24 and so on, which touch on the historic environment in a really big, big way. And then that feeds into the Historic Environment Action Plan, which is part of a suite of documents for, for managing heritage in, in that. So that's sort of the background um, platform. Um, and the process, I suppose, then, is trying to draw all of these different groups into a, a coherent, these different interests in managing the landscape, the, the heritage of the, of the National Park into some sort of coherent form. So we began by having um, large scale meetings, inviting a wide range of stakeholders, including these groups you see here, business, residents, landowners and so on, to participate and to discuss how they thought um, a historic environment action plan could work and might work and to reflect all of these different, I wouldn't say competing interests, but they're, they're kind of overlapping interests, I like to think. Um, and from that broad historic environment partnership, we drew uh, what we've called the core group, which is a small group of people who have worked together to develop this, this plan. And that's consisted of um, officers of the park, uh, people like myself, I've been representing the, the, the three Welsh Archaeological Trusts that uh, cover the park's territory, but archaeologists. We've had uh, colleagues from CADU and from the Royal Commission uh, giving their contributions, as well as uh, local 
groups and other bodies uh, of more or less specialist reference story, um, local archaeological groups, and so on and so forth, who've been here contributing. And we've all sat around the table and had lots of discussions which have led to this, this plan. And in fact, we, what's interesting is we haven't, in fact, and this goes back to what Helen was saying, sat around a table. Um, we've sat uh, on a screen. Um, it's been hilarious this morning bumping into people who I've spent a lot of time with on the screen, but have never actually met in person. I saw Julian in the past, and they're like, we'd never actually physically met. And yet we've been having these meetings uh, for two years. And this is meeting three. You can see we're all smiley and shiny and cheerful at meeting three. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had meeting 21. We're still smiley and cheerful, it has to be said. Uh, but, you know, we've had 21 meetings over two years in this space. <laughs> um, not, we've not actually met, and yet we've been able to achieve all of this thing. So at our first meetings, or in our early meetings, we identified the goals that we needed to, um, to do, how we wanted to take this process forward, the goals for the process, not the goals for the plan so much, but, you know, committing to shared objectives, trying to encapsulate best practice, um, engage as widely as we could with our communities, um, and, and improve capacity to actually deliver. Again, this goes back to what Helen was saying about you know, very well having these lovely words, but if we can't then deliver the, the things that are in the action plan, um, then what can we do? So we came out with a vision, uh, which uh, is about managing the, the, the national park. I'll, I'll read this to you, actually. I do have a bit, I have got a bit of time, because home is so brief and uh, timely, and Martin's yet to wave his, his signs at me, so I'll, I will read this out. It's not too long. The historic environment of the national park will be carefully managed and celebrated, supporting biodiversity recovery and increasing resilience in the face of climate change. It will be valued and enjoyed by visitors and local communities who will be inspired by a wealth of historic sites, stories, and local traditions. Knowledge and understanding of our historic landscapes will be improved, informing and supporting the development of sustainable strategies for the future. That's our vision. Isn't that great? Um, Okay, nice words. How do we translate those into action? So we've identified, and this is a lot of words, I'm not going to read them all out to you, don't worry. Um, these four key goals um, uh, in the plan. They're all in the plan. The plan's downstairs. You can take away copies. It's on the internet. You can read them yourself. But essentially, the four goals are that the historic environment is fully integrated into the management of the park. The conservation of the historic environment takes place, as Catherine and Helen have already said, in close coordination and cooperation with climate action nature recovery to ensure resilience. We also want to broaden participation and engagement, especially among audiences who have not always been able to engage with cultural heritage or with the National Park. And we, we've, we've thought a lot in our 24 meetings about those communities just outside the park who maybe don't have the opportunities that, that people within the park or in other parts of the world have. And how to enable those people to come, come in and, and enjoy benefits. And above all, to improve collaboration and uh, capacity to deliver these objectives. So within the plan itself, there are these four objectives, collaboration and partnership, conservation management, valuing and celebrating our heritage, and developing knowledge and understanding. And again, these are four key objectives, which are measurable. So they're smart objectives, and they are time-bound, um, but they are um, interlinked and overlapping. As well. And within each of these objectives, there are various um, aims, promoting and supporting collaboration between heritage organizations in terms of conservation management, um, project planning and interpretation, uh, interaction between natural and cultural ecosystems, um, and preserving and enhancing historic assets, valuing and celebrating, promoting understanding and significance. Um, values of the historic environment, again, improving capacity, promoting engagement, and knowledge and understanding. This comes back, actually, to what Helen said about blood pressure. You know, you don't know the problem until somebody takes reading. And it's this evidence baselines, research priorities, this understanding where we are now, or where we have got to. And there have been heritage audits of the park in the past, but this is kind of an opportunity now to reset, think about where we are, and how we can best manage the park in the future um, and develop the skills and training that we need to do that. So within these broad headings, 
there are this action plan. So if you get to the back of the document, there's this very detailed list of plans that we've all sat through in our temporal meetings, we've gone through blow by blow, what these all are, how they might be achieved, who's going to achieve them, or who we think might lead on achieving them, because this is a partnership, remember, and what we might need uh, you know, from the national park, but from the wider community and from the world to try and deliver, deliver these, and how we make a contribution as a partnership in ensuring that these goals are met. Because again, it's not about you know, what, what can the park do for us, it's about what we can do as a, as a society, I suppose, but as a group of historic environment professionals for the park. So current actions, I suppose, are to start with this heritage audit. And we've got Rob Robertson to deliver this heritage audit, which has been, um, which is ongoing. Um, and this is this blood pressure thing. And he's, he's been looking at not just the condition of monuments in the landscape, which is a very traditional sort of top down way of thinking about how heritage is managed. You know, has this particular pile of stones fallen down slightly more than it did five years ago? I mean, there's part, there's, that's part of it, but it's actually also, you know, thinking about how people engage with heritage, how heritage is embedded within local community, what people actually think about heritage, what is heritage, and what sort of mechanisms can we best develop to deliver an improvement in the condition of heritage and its engagement and interaction with other aspects of, of the work in the park. So whether there's whether it's initiatives around biodiversity or visitor management or sustainable housing or tourism or a range of or employment or a range of a range of things, how does the historic environment fit into that? How can we measure the impact of these things on the historic environment and how therefore you, how therefore can we show an improvement? So this audit is ongoing uh, and when it's complete we can have meeting twenty two or indeed we can unfortunately and we can discuss findings and where we're going to go with that. And then we're thinking a little bit more about more planning, capacity building, where we can apply for funding to try and do some work. So that is a very brief, maybe not as brief as I should have been, but brief enough, I think, overview of the Historic Environment Action Plan by way of a launch. Uh, and I would just really like to thank you, as I say, I'm the chair, but I, I take no credit for this, because actually it's down to the officers of the National Park. I mentioned Alice. Sophie has come in since I mentioned her before, so I will, I will embarrass Sophie again because uh, she has really held, held the group together. Uh, Helen, Jodie, Sai, everybody really who's, who's in the room, uh, mostly people are in the room today. Um, so just thank you, thank you to everybody, and um, me done. So thank you. <laughs>